Uh, hello, this is the seventh um, interview of the Southern Nature Art Exhibition. I'm here with James Sinclair. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. Yeah. Um, where am I Zooming you from today? Where do you find yourself quarantined these days? I am currently holed up in my uh, home uh, in Western Southampton. Um, sadly, my studio uh, went into lockdown, um, same as everything else. It hasn't opened up back yet. It hasn't opened up. Yeah, so I'm currently, you're going to have to edit that, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm currently um, from, yeah, from my home. So. Nice. Yeah. And um, the sort of big question is, what, do, what medium do you work in? And sort of why do you love it so much? Um, so I predominantly work with uh, an airbrush and acrylic inks. And I love it because with the airbrush, you get um, such vibrancy of colours. Um, you can get really subtle transitions that you just can't get with a brush. Um, yeah, you can still get all of those details. And for me, it's just the tool that felt the most right. Um, I was used to try and do oil painting and though I still go back to it and though I enjoy oil painting, the airbrush is where I felt most at home. It's the moment I picked it up, I was just like, yeah, this is, this is it for me. So yeah, and I love it. Awesome. And obviously it's not the most traditional medium. And so when you think art, you often think you know, pen and paper or paint even. We rarely think airbrush, and I'd just love to know more about the sort of context in which you first picked up that tool. Um, so I suppose it came from my some of my artistic influences. Um, so I came initially from um, enjoying comic books as my form of art, and as I grew up and got older, um, I started getting into some of the other artists like Louis Royo, uh, Soriyama, um, H.R. Geiger, and they used an airbrush and their work just had this slightly otherworldly look to it that I just wanted. And um, yeah, so when I found out they used an airbrush, um, I saved up my money from my first sale, actually at what was uh, Marwell Art Society. Um, so I sold one of my early charcoal pieces, and with that money I bought my first airbrush, and I haven't looked back. Amazing. Uh, has art always been something you've been interested in? Like, has, has it just been from childhood always something you've wanted to do? Yeah, pretty much. Um, so we were quite a poor family and one of the good ways of keeping me quiet and entertained was to give me a pen and paper and tell me to go off and draw something. And I was quite lucky that I had two older sisters who also drew and so they were always kind of encouraging me and giving me tips and my grandfather was a painter as well. Um, so yeah, sort of been in the family. Um, out of my sisters, I'm the only one that's sort of carried on uh, and pushed it uh, as far as I have. But yeah, no, it's something I've, I've always done. I've always enjoyed it. Amazing. Um, and obviously you're very um, involved with what is now the Southern Nature Art Exhibition. Um, and is that just a case of, it's a great community or is it sort of, do you, how did you get involved? I'll start there. <laughs> So it goes right back to pretty much the beginning. Um, so other than my grandfather, I didn't really know anybody else that did any uh, painting. And because I used an airbrush, he thought I was a cheater anyway. Um, so <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to find some kind of community or some place with other like-minded artists because I felt very much sort of on my own. And I was um, at an art store um, in Southampton and a lady behind me um, happened to overhear a conversation I had with the, the cash, cashier about are there any art clubs and she worked with Marwell Art Society which was sort of um, the, the precursor to Southern Nature and Art. So I got involved in that uh, and when that ended and Nick started up Southern Nature and Art um, I just sort of ended up just carrying on with that and um, I think it's incredibly important especially for Southampton because um, there are so few um, exhibitions that happen in Southampton. There's no commercial uh, galleries. So to have a, an art exhibition at that level, at that standard, that gets the crowds in that it does, um, it's something I just have to support because um, uh, otherwise I end up just complaining there's nowhere really for us to sell their work. And if I'm not willing to help do something to kind of change that, then I'm, I'm also sort of part of the problem. But yeah, Southern Nature and Art, um, Nick and Caroline do an absolutely amazing job. And I don't think a lot of people realise just how much hard work goes into the exhibitions each year and anything I can do that, that can help kind of ease that load and make it a better exhibition. 
something I've got to do. It's true, they're doing great work, yeah. Um, and of course, the thing that unites all these artists is their love of nature. Um, and I was wondering, sort of, what does it mean to you? So sort of, why do you love creating, um, creating natural scenes and just capturing them so well? That's, that's different. I, um, I was kind of having a similar conversation the other day that we as humans take an, a an active uh, and curious um, sort of view on the nat natural world and animals. We're the only ones that kind of go out to try and find and understand them. Animals don't care about us and, you know, uh, a gorilla doesn't care about a kangaroo. It's, there's no curiosity there. So we're really, really curious about that. But animals don't have any guilt. They're just animals. You know, the gorilla wakes up every day. You know, he doesn't want to be anything else. He's, he's a gorilla. He's a gorilla. 100%. We're always questioning ourselves. We've got all of these mixed emotions. I think the thing with nature is it's just there and it is what it is. And there's something pure about it. Um, and so I try and capture that in my, my artwork. Um, and sometimes the, the struggles or the relationships those animals have with uh, people as well. Amazing. And I suppose um, with airbrush, it's obviously a different process, I imagine, to um, sort of more traditional medium. So just tell us a little bit more about that. Tell us how you go about making things in a practical way. Um, so I normally start off with a few sketches. Um, so very traditional, get the, the pencils out and I'll uh, kind of, um, do some um, composition sketches and also if there's anything in the image that might be difficult for me to see if you saw it I'll, I'll sketch it out um, and once I've drawn it a few times then in my head I kind of understand its relationship um, so once I've got that down um, I'll then go over to then start painting uh, onto the uh, canvas or in my case generally it's artboard um, so with airbrush, um, I've started doing more underpainting now. So I'll sort of lay out the, uh, the composition. I'll get everything in the position that it needs to be, and I'll start with an underpainting. Um, I then very carefully mix the paints to try and get the right colors and right tones, um, and then lay those over. And then it's a case of just towards the end, tinting them just to push or pull them um, towards uh, sort of a more pleasing color or sort of contrast or composition. Amazing. Um, I suppose I really love to know where your drive comes from to do that. To sort of, it's a it's a long project. Sort of, yeah, you're constantly working on art. And what, where's your drive come from? <laughs> um, that's a, that is a difficult one. Um, I think most most artists we're slightly uh, obsessive compulsive. Um, so once we've kind of just got into something, um, we're always trying to push it. And I think the other thing with artists as well, and slightly me, is that there's Three, four, three or four stages you go through with the painting. It's like you have this idea that you're really, really excited about. You start it, and if it goes well, you're really, really excited about it. But as the, the painting progresses, there's invariably always a couple of mistakes or a few things you're not 100% happy with. So by the time the painting ends, all you see is the bits that you're not happy with. And so your drive then is to go on to the next painting and try and do one that's better. And so for me, it's yeah, just always trying to push to get to uh, as good as I can be um, and to try and capture everything um, in a way that I'm happy with. Sure. And a good question from that would be, what makes you happy? Like, why, why is your art not like anybody else's? So what, what a, a special effect or what special um, feeling do you try and put into your art that makes it, that makes it yours, I suppose? Uh, well, the thing I found over the years um, is that my relationship with my art and people's relationship with my art is different. Um, my experience is very much different from somebody else that views it. Um, hopefully they get some of what I put into it. Um, but yeah, my, my main goal is just to try and get emotions into something and to make something seem realistic, seem real, but sometimes to add elements in that weren't initially there. Um, so it does make me laugh to some extent when people kind of go oh, i might as well have just had the photograph i think well no because the, the photograph doesn't exist you know i've painted this i've and even though the reference um you know the main subject may be very close to the reference in its painting you change it and uh, i think there is always a little bit of the artist in the work um, no matter how close it is to the photograph um yeah i, I generally try to steer away from 
just doing pure copies of a photograph, unless that happens to be a commission and that's what I've been asked for. Sure. Uh, can we see what that looks like? Can we see some of your paintings? Yep, certainly. Um, so this is one of my most recent ones. Uh, and uh, this little chap here is uh, McCall. Right. Um, so I tried to, to kind of capture uh, quite a cool feeling. He's quite warm, but the background's quite cool. Um, and I've put this bowl in, um, which is um, one I based off of a Moroccan, a traditional Moroccan bowl. There's um, of course, uh, from Morocco. Um, and I've called it Next to Civilized. Um, now on the bowl, if I can zoom in, if it'll capture it, there's actually a couple of guys fighting um, that are in, on the engraving. Um, so though we've made the bowl, um, you know, civilizations made this bowl, it's that uncivilizedness of man. And you've got this very calm, McCall sat there and it's kind of that sort of, I suppose, juxtaposition, that contrast between um, man and wildlife that I wanted to capture um, sort of in this painting. Uh, got another one down here. Um, so this one was, uh, was a good idea when I started it. Um, <laughs> I really wanted to capture more detailed backgrounds, uh, which is something that's always fascinated me and um, yeah the background on this one took me absolutely ages and it was um, I actually stopped uh, and left it for about a year um, there was something about it I just wasn't very happy with and I just needed to walk away um, sometimes you get so close to your artwork that you can't see what it is that's bothering you so I actually left it for a year and then came back and it was actually quite a small thing and, uh, and now I love it so that'll be um, at the next exhibition when uh, next year. But, uh, and then um, I also do portrait work as well. Um, so I've got this one here, um, which great. was from, taken from a photograph of a homeless man that I met in Poland. And he just had this serenity um, in his look um, that I just wanted to capture, that and the epic beard. Um, but again, I always try and change things. So I made the background look a little bit more derelict to kind of emphasize the homelessness. Um, but I also put um, a wanted poster of Santa Claus up the top. Um, now there's a few sort of narratives I wanted to add in with that was that, um, you know, you see a homeless guy and you just brush them off. Um, but what if, you know, theoretically Santa Claus was homeless and he goes to see how you treat people and how you treat the, the ones that are the, the poorest in society. Um, so, you know, it's just that kind of how we give worth to people. Um, so I really want to try and challenge that in the, this painting. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. No worries. Um, and am I right in saying you teach um, art and workshops as well as making your own stuff? Yes, I do. Yeah, I'd um, started, uh, so to, I suppose, towards the beginning of this year to do uh, workshops, drawing workshops and airbrush workshops. Um, I've had a few um, sort of success stories so far of um, uh, people, artists who have wanted to try airbrush for many, many years. But it's that kind of knowing where to start, which um, being the fact it's so different from other ones, you know, you've got all of the different equipments, airbrushes, air compressors, all the different paints to use. It's quite a daunting task to try and jump into something. So um, I do an introductory workshop that allows people to come in, have a try with some of my airbrushes, um, and I try and teach them the basics. So if they want to progress, they can buy some equipment and um, get started. And they're, you know, that way they don't um, end up wasting money on uh, the wrong airbrushes, cheap airbrushes or bad air compressors, uh, which are some of the mistakes I made when I first of all started. So if I can help people avoid those, um, all the better. Um, but I'm looking to start doing more advanced ones, um, well, when we can start doing workshops again, I suppose. Sure. Uh, a lot of artists have gone online during lockdown, but have you, or have you just- um, I've, I've done a, a painting workshop online, but I haven't given any. Um, I very okay. much took the, the lockdown period to um, basically just lock myself away and just focus on paintings. Sure. Um, you know, I had a couple of commissions, which was nice. And, you know, I have to thank uh, people who are willing to kind of uh, commission artists, um, certainly the ones that commissioned uh, for me. 
um, to do art during this period because it really does make such a difference to us artists. Uh, and what value would you say you take from teaching? So why do you do it in the first place? Um, I've always done a little bit of teaching throughout my life, uh, whether it was um, when I was younger, I used to do martial arts and also um, played guitar for many years. And every time I've done any teaching, uh, it's made me reflect on my process and what it is I'm actually doing. Um, you, you end up doing so many things when you paint subconsciously that when you have to teach that, you have to kind of almost stop yourself and break it down and go, actually, what is it that I am doing? Um, and then you end up finding you might have a few bad habits that you picked up yourself. So um, you get to then work on those. But it really does help you define what your process is. And it helps me to then break that down to try and try and teach other people. Um, and in so doing, you know, it teaches me as well. And we were talking about um, lockdown just now. And I was sort of thinking a lot of people, I imagine, have picked up um, art in some form or another during lockdown. Um, and I just want to know what advice you give to somebody who's, you know, he's coming to the end of lockdown now, but how do they carry on? Ooh, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I would say you're going to get, depending on what level you're at, um, I'd say sketching is, you know, one of the key fundamentals. Um, but learning the, the, the drawing fundamentals and how to lay out a drawing, um, it's boring and it, it to begin with it doesn't necessarily feel like you're gonna your your artwork's improving but to learn um uh something like you know the laying out of the head with the lines um you know perspective um these things are going to help you so much further down the road um if all you do is look and draw what you see your lines and your proportions are always going to be slightly out eventually you'll get good at doing that and you will learn to see um, you'll be able to get a lot better a lot quicker by learning those um, those learning fundamentals. Um, so I recommend the Loomis method as a sort of a good starting point. Um, and uh, Andrew Loomis was a great artist back, I think, in the 70s. Um, he literally wrote the book on how to draw uh, heads and hands. Uh, and I highly recommend the book, even though it's old, it's still a very, very good book. So, um, yeah, but with um, wildlife, um, drawing them, yeah, it's just a case of um, trying to look for the basic shapes, the basic forms, and try and get them laid out equally. If you can get your scales right, if you can get the animal um, to the right proportions, then you're, you know, a big way there to kind of having a good drawing. Um, then it's to learn the other basics, which are values, to get your light and your darks right. If you can see on a drawing that you need to, you know, your, your darks, your darkest darks are as dark as they need to be, your lights are as near they need to be, everything's going to look 3D. Um, and then once you get into painting, then it's uh, colour theory. And uh, that's something I'm, I'm still working on and trying to improve upon. Brilliant. Um, that's the end of my questions. Thank you so much for going through them with me. Um, and obviously, you're, um, you've got a bio page for you on the, on the new Southern Nature website, which is great. You've got your own website, which I'm sure we'll link into this video. Um, yeah, just thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you so much for answering, answering these questions. Um, yeah, have a great day. No, thanks, Joe. Yeah, have a good one as well. Bye-bye. Thank you.